Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. Dirty talk. Some people can pull it off, but some people really can't. When Lily White tried to talk dirty to her husband, it started out awkward and then got hilarious. Kimberly A. Bear Gregory reads us this week's essay. You can see her in ABC's Kevin Probably Saves the World and HBO's Vice Principals. She reads Lily White's essay, Let's Not Pretend to Be Who We Aren't. One rule of thumb for marriage would be to avoid imitating Julia Child's voice during sex. I learned this lesson one Sunday afternoon while fooling around with my husband. I recently had bought the book, The Fine Art of Erotic Talk by Bunny Gabriel, and I was up to chapter five, fantasy and role play. Miss Gabriel writes that married men sometimes like to pretend they're having sex with someone else when they're with their wives. Just why my husband would feel the need to do this is beyond me. I certainly don't pretend he's Brad Pitt or anyone else for that matter. But one must try to be open to new things. Miss Gabriel goes on to say that costumes or wigs can help with your partner's fantasies but words are more effective. As she points out, the brain is by far the most potent sex organ of all. That's definitely true for me, except my brain suffers from a few bad habits that don't always turn out so well in bed. Back in the 1990s, when the internet was just getting rolling, I knew people who knew people who would go into chat rooms. I'd never joined one of these virtual conversations myself, but I was curious. One night during a huge blizzard, I decided to try it. I had consumed half a bottle of wine that evening, which helped me overcome my initial apprehension. Plus, I felt safer somehow being in the middle of a snowstorm. I figured that if some sexual predator lurking in the chat room were able to identify me by my dirty thoughts, the weather might slow him down before he showed up on my doorstep. I logged on and looked around for a chat room for singles. Soon, a box popped up with words inside. A man, presumably, wanted to know what I was wearing. Hmm, I thought. He's into fashion. What could I tell him? I typed, snowsuit, and hit send. Soon I saw a response. It's time to take it off and come inside, don't you think? My heart leapt. I had gotten a bite. I chewed on my thumbnail and began typing. I enter the warm apartment, and you shut the door behind me. Melting snow drips from my mucklucks and onto the floor near your bare toes. Slowly, you unzip my orange parka. The dialogue box disappeared. My chat buddy was gone. At first, I felt insulted, then depressed. This was the story of my life. Any time someone was mildly attracted to me, I told a lame joke and he ran away screaming. Dating me was a fairy tale trial by fire designed to allow only the most tenacious of suitors inside the castle. If a potential boyfriend could keep up with my witticisms, then he might have a chance. It's a tribute to my husband that he was able to prevail. Since we met 17 years ago, sex with us has always been good, but lately, he's been trying to change things up. He's been talking dirty. 
He's good at it. And now he wants me to try to do the same for him. Given my experience in the chat room, this set a familiar panic in motion. This is why I got the book. In her book, Miss Gabriel describes a, quote, dirty talk exploration game to identify certain turn-on words. She provides long lists of suggested slang for male and female anatomy because it's just not that sexy to say penis, testicles, or scrotal sack. Although I am fond of the term scrotal sack from a purely comedic standpoint. You should experiment to see which of these terms your partner prefers. I imagine putting my husband on a gurney and attaching electrodes to his penis. I wear a lab coat and read from a list of possible words. Vulva? No response. Venus Mons? Yawn. When I utter a crude term for the same body part, though, the needle jumps. I put a star in my notebook. In real life, experimental data is not so easy to gather. It's not often that my husband and I have sex, so when we have the opportunity, I am disinclined to risk destroying the mood in the name of research. After work and dinner and homework and bedtime, we're tired, and sex is usually the last thing on our minds. Typically, we have a couple of glasses of wine and watch the latest offerings on Netflix until we fall asleep on the couch. Because neither one of us is a morning person, that's out. Afternoons seem to work the best mood-wise, as long as daughter is safely out of the house. But the planning required to arrange childcare undermines the whole spontaneity thing. The last time we had sex, he went into one of his new fantasies. Linda came over last night wearing that little pink number of hers, he said. So I invited her up to our bedroom. Yeah, I played along, hoping that this was only a fantasy, because Linda was gorgeous and lived across the street. And while I'm up in here having sex with her, you walk in and you're really jealous because you want me all to yourself the familiar anxiety these fantasies produced. Was this his way to introduce the idea of a threesome? I couldn't be sure. I willed myself not to be jealous, but then he stopped what he was doing and looked at me. Where'd you go? He asked. Nowhere, I said. Still here. It's just a fantasy, he said, smiling. Just try to have fun with it. He delivered this line with all the cheeriness of a cruise ship entertainment director. I wanted desperately to be more fun, but there was something that got in the way. I felt either threatened or silly, and neither feeling was particularly sexy. After being married for 14 years, lust has turned into love, and for this, I am thankful. But love means seeing the loved one in a different way. In the book, I and Thou, the philosopher Martin Buber wrote how desire itself is transformed from dream into reality. Love means your spouse is no longer a sex object to experience, but a fellow being with whom you experience the entire universe. It's a little abstract, but it explains why I never notice when my husband gets a haircut. When having sex with someone new, the experience is like riding a wave or driving a fast car. Who you are with is less important than the quality of the ride. With someone you love, the quality of the ride often starts to take a back seat as sex becomes freighted with intimacy. Occasionally, it can be a relief to be treated like a sex object again, if only for the sake of nostalgia. If that means learning how to talk dirty for my husband, I had to give it a try. Although Ms. Gabriel says these sexy vocal skills can be learned, she hasn't taken regional accents into account. I'm from the Midwest and do not have the most sensual of voices. 
A friend sometimes does an imitation at parties of his Midwestern ex girlfriend. Oh, God, he says. Oh, geez, yeah. I laugh along with the Easterners in the crowd as if I'm one of them, but deep down, I fear that's what I sound like too. Since moving to New York, I hear these differences in accents, but as much as I've tried to round out my flat vowels and mellow my abrasive tone, I remain a girl from Illinois. It might be different if I spoke French or Portuguese. The accent would compensate for the nasal timbre. I know Julia Child isn't French, but as we had just watched Julie and Julia the night before, I suppose she was on my mind that afternoon. It was a warm spring day, and the sun shined through our bedroom window. For a few precious hours, our daughter was at someone else's house, and my husband and I lay on the bed like lazy cats, alternately reading the newspaper and napping. Something about the feeling of sun on skin seems to revitalize the bones and awaken the spirit. And soon we began caressing and kissing. I fell into my usual grateful silence. But then I decided to give Miss Gabriel's advice a try. I mustered all the courage I had. And then, gazing lovingly at the top of my husband's head, I let rip a jovial, Bon appetit! He looked up at me and groaned. Perhaps when it comes to Miss Gabriel's strategies, it's best to cut my losses and work with the talents I have, like putting together a romantic playlist on my iPod and lighting some candles. Maybe I'll even invest in a pair of non flannel pajamas. Kimberly A. Bear Gregory, reading Lily White's essay, Let's Not Pretend to Be Who We Aren't. We'll hear more clean talk from Lily after the break. We're back. It's Modern Love, the podcast. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. Lily White still has a copy of Bonnie Gabriel's book, but it's not next to her bed. She says it's gathering dust on a bookshelf somewhere. Since her essay was published, she's thought more about her initial reluctance to experiment with erotic talk. I couldn't get the difference between the talking and the reality. And I was afraid if I opened myself up to talking dirty that somehow... I would be sort of opening us up to all kinds of things where I'd have to buy lotions and robes and uh, drapes. <laughs> but that was then. Lily now realizes her reluctance was rooted in fear. My resistance to it, it made me realize that I was insecure about losing my husband. And so going through this process, you realize... If you're secure enough in your relationship, you can say all kinds of things and you can do all kinds of things, and it's not going to threaten the relationship. Lily says these experiments, though comical, helped build a wonderful level of trust that radiates through her marriage. My husband and I have a great relationship because we do things for each other without asking. And maybe it's that whole nonverbal thing that I like so much. <laughs> also, he doesn't keep track, and I don't think I do either, of, you know, I did this for you, and then you, you have to do this for me. Like, we don't keep track of points. It's just sort of given freely, and that's an amazing thing. Lily's friends and colleagues are endlessly entertained by this essay. She works as a professional musician, and several weeks after the piece was published, she remembers arriving at a gig. And I get to the bandstand, and all of a sudden, this guitar player wheels around and goes, Bon Appetit! <laughs> and I thought, what? What's he talking about? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Lily White. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband and 17-year-old daughter. After the break, Modern Love editor Daniel Jones on sex and keeping things interesting. Plus, Kimberly A. Bear Gregory on her own awkward moments. Dan Jones says that he loved Lily's comic take on a common problem. The number of people I hear from who are trying to figure out how to have sex again when they're when they're they've been married for 10 years or 20 years or or whatever it's kind of remarkable and it's not at all surprising that having sex with the same person for year after year would get a little routine and you need to like figure out um, what to do if that's going to be important to you and the lengths people go to and the ways that people try to deal with it just can't help but be comical Thanks again to Kimberly A. Bear Gregory. Here's why she was drawn to Lily's piece. I chose this essay because it seems in some way to mirror my own challenges um, with being a bit awkward in in moments of um, seriousness and definitely intimacy. I can't stop laughing when things happen. All manner of things <laughs> happen. <laughs> This is why. This is why I chose it, because I wouldn't know what to say. Miss Gabriel, Julia Child's voice would ring in my ear, too. That makes sense. Bon appetit. Kimberly A. Bear Gregory. You can see her in ABC's Kevin Probably Saves the World and HBO's Vice Principals. Next week, Cleopatra Coleman, who stars in Fox's The Last Man on Earth, reads an essay about the catcalls, the grabbing, and the fear that can come with having a woman's body. I am 24, and my body makes life dangerous for me. My breasts, my hips, the way I walk. Any woman's breasts, any woman's hips, the way any woman walks. Modern Love is a production of the New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, John Parati, Amory Sievertson, and Caitlin O'Keefe. Additional sound design by Matt Reed. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week.